Um, good morning to our audience uh, joining the conference today, sitting in front of their screens, and a very good morning to our speakers on panel one. Uh, welcome to the first panel titled Community and Social Development in the Post-Pandemic Era. It has been more than two years into the pandemic, and it is clear that the impact of COVID-19 is unevenly distributed across the population, falling disproportionately on the most vulnerable individuals and communities. As countries around the world, including Singapore, moves towards a COVID-19 endemic state, the economic and social impact is likely to be felt for years to come. The post-pandemic world could experience even greater inequalities unless it is being mitigated by the necessary global government and local response. So, in our local context, what does post-pandemic social work practice and community development look like? In this panel, we hope to facilitate reflections um, on the assumptions that we hold as social service professionals. Whether you're here as a social worker, a community worker, a policy maker, or even a researcher, and we hope to facilitate discussion on the innovations and the adaptations necessary to address the changing needs of the most vulnerable. So um, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker on the panel today. Um, we're very happy to have Associate Professor Timothy Sim with us. Since 2020, uh, Professor Sim has been the Head of Program, Master of Counseling at the SR Nardin School of Human Development at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Before that, he was based in Hong Kong for more than 18 years. He's a leading international scholar in social work practice research, family therapy, and disaster management. In response to the pandemic and its effect on social work practice, Timothy has published several articles on the challenges and opportunities facing families. Today, he's presenting on safe uncertainty in social work practice. In his presentation, he will explore the way social work can make a difference for vulnerable families and communities safely in these uncertain times. Um, please join me to welcome uh, Professor Timothy Sim. Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, thank you uh, to SSRC for uh, inviting me to join this conference. Uh, today is Social Workers Day, so happy Social Work Day to all social workers out there. Uh, let me begin with my presentation. Uh, can I just double check with the uh, hosts and MC that you are able to see my uh, PPT? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I've entitled my topic today to be safe uncertainty in social work practice as COVID-19 emerges as we walk out of COVID-19. Um, it's going to be based on um, two frameworks as well as the work that I'm currently doing in Singapore. Um, as COVID-19, um, oops, sorry. As COVID-19 emerges, I think our family, uh, our communities uh, uh, will be, our life will be changing in a very different way than we could imagine. We have entered into the new normal now. I would expect us to go into another new normal and this new normal will continue to be new and continue to be normal in a very different way. Safety in all sense of the word, it's paramount. Um, but how can we be very certain what safety is like in a volatile context like what we have now and continuing to emerge? Um, using Barry Mason's modality of uh, safe uncertainty and um, Salvador Mnuchin and his colleagues, the craft of family therapy, challenging certainties, my presentation today will explore the way social workers could make a difference for our vulnerable families and communities in a safe way in uncertain times. Okay, I'm trying to minimize. Okay. Now, safety. Safety first. Having been working, have, I have been working in disaster field for about uh, more than a decade now. It's something that is very clear at the back of our minds coming into a COVID situation, I think we all have a heightened sense of safety. However, there is also uncertainty. And here you can see on the right hand side, what are some of the sense or emotional states that we are in when we are in a certain state or when we are in an uncertain state. And 
intersectioning between certainty and uncertainty. I think it's always about learning, experiencing, growth and opportunity. Um, let me begin with introducing to you out there who are social service providers, uh, a framework by Barry Mason. This is Barry Mason, who was doing a presentation for Counseling and Care Center in Novotel. Barry knows Singapore well. He has been coming to uh, Singapore to train with Counseling and Care Center. He was a very good friend of Anthony Yeo. Um, our late Anthony Yeo has passed on, and so has Barry. He passed on on 16th January 2021. His uh, toward safe uncertainty model uses two dimensions, safety and certainty, or unsafe and uncertainty. Using a grid like that, he came up with four different dimensions. Now applying it to uh, the COVID-19 situation, let me elaborate what safe uncertainty was Barry talking about. Let's begin with unsafe uncertainty, which means oftentimes it's a loss of the belief that one can usefully influence events in our own lives and the lives of significant others. Now, you will realize that it's not just about ourselves, but also about people who are very dear to us or even the clients that we work with. For example, now we are talking about um, uh, Omi, uh, Delta, Omi, Omi Delta or Omicron Delta that is coming up. What is this variant of uh, Omicron going to be like? We have very little idea. Tests are still being run. Um, another example of unsafe uncertainty where we are not very clear if we would have an influence over somebody's life would be, for example, using couple and family therapy uh, for children, families uh, who have experienced violence and abuse because there is not enough evidence that it definitely works. Now, it is also the new norm in post-COVID-19. Are we going to be totally unsafe? Are we going to be totally uncertain? Or are we going to be totally safe and certain? These are things that we cannot be totally sure. And so this is something like an unsafe uncertainty. Let me move on to look at unsafe certainty. How can certainty be unsafe, you may ask? Well, when we are certain of our points of view, can sometimes lend us into unsafe situations. For example, in this COVID situation, if we were to exert in a very certain way about our rights not to wear masks, not to be vaccinated, it can be unsafe. Or in the context of social work, um, we are very sure that uh, it was the Chinese who started the Wuhan virus, which is a term that we shouldn't be using. Or we are very certain that migrant or domestic workers spread COVID-19 to our families. Or as long as um, personal protection order is in place, victims are safe. Now, these may be the kind of certainty that could be unsafe. Of course, you may disagree and we can continue to dialogue about it. But if I'm very certain about what I'm saying, please note, it can be unsafe. What about safe certainty? In a time, in a disaster situation, in a crisis situation, people want to have control. People want to be certain if they are able to control the situation, if they know what is the next step, if they have the information. So oftentimes the desire for certainty has been met and often in the form of protective measures in trying or uncertain types. And they are usually imposed from outside. So uh, we may need to have the measures, the policies, and even um, the practice that would tell us that we are safe. Um, for example, currently in Singapore, we have the SMMs, the safe management measures to do with social distancing, 
uh, to do with ART, PCR. These are measures that can hopefully give us some certainty that we are safe. Um, in the violence situation, for example, removing the perpetrator will probably and will hopefully reduce the sex abuse of children at home when we implement the law. What about safe uncertainty? Can uncertainty be safe? Well, in Barry Mason's idea, he was just talking about always evolving when you work towards safe uncertainty. Without unhelpful difference, can be safely, if at times uncomfortably, explore as a part of developing so that we can be more constructive and also build safer relationships. Looking at the current situation where we are contending with COVID-19, since we cannot be certain, we then need to be uncertain, but definitely in a safe way. For example, we are now having vaccinations. Would there be side effects, you'll be asking? Will it be complicating my chronic conditions? These, and then eventually we will still have to use it, but use it with a lot of caution, use it with a lot of care. And for example, we are using systemic family therapy to decrease the relapse of family violence in Singapore. And that is something that we are experimenting because we, in the past, we have been focusing only working with the perpetrator and the victims on very separate uh, basis. We do not work together as a family. Once the safety is assured, we will bring different parties and stakeholders, including children to come together and working with it, with the family in a very safe and careful way. Though we are not very sure that we can definitely get the results, but we are monitoring it very, very carefully um, and taking safe measures. So we cannot be certain that it definitely works, but I think we need to be working on some of these measures so as to be able to help all to be safe. Now, I'm not going to elaborate any further on the safe uncertainty. Um, I have written an article reflecting the differences between Hong Kong and Singapore when I was just about coming back. Qualitative Social Work invited um, me to write an article, so I did. And if you're interested, this is uh, downloadable for free. So please look at this article. And that was some of the reflections I had about two years ago. I have a different way of seeing and thinking now. Um, in order for me to uh, talk more a, a little about uh, safe uncertainty, I would also like to focus on family violence and child abuse, which has been a big issue during COVID-19. And according to a UN Human Rights Special Procedure Report on Singapore, we realised that during COVID-19 circuit breaker period from 7th April to 1st June, there was an increase in the referrals and calls related to domestic conflicts and violence in Singapore. In comparing the two weeks before and after circuit breaker started, NGO-run family violence specialists saw a 37% increase in calls. And the situation has uh, continued and uh, the specialist centers, the three specialist centers in Singapore are contending with more cases during this period. So I would like to use this as a case in point to look at how we can work using a safe, uncertain uh, position, which Barry Mason talked about. Um, however, uh, when I was trying to work with PAVE, uh, which is one of the leading centers on the, the right-hand side, uh, I had the privilege of work uh, working with them since last July using a systemic uh, perspective. Uh, when we were trying to work out, I was very conscious that we need to have a framework that would help all of us to be able to scrutinize the work that we do and also to uh, work together and train and supervise our workers. So I adopted the craft of family therapy, which is a framework that looks at how we can challenge certainties when working with couples and families. So I would like for you to uh, read this book as well if you're interested in uh, what um, it offers. This is a book by my supervisors, supervisors, 
uh, that Dr. Salvador Menichin, and um, he's been around since 1921 and has passed on already uh, since October 2017. I've learned together with him, supervised by him, and worked together with him in China. And he is a man, uh, in another occasion, if I have the opportunity to share with you his work, his thinking, and his life. Now, in this craft of family therapy, there is a beautiful summary or a pouch we call the therapist pouch. And in this pouch, basically, there are four different dimensions. There is the basic principles, three of them. There will be the techniques, five of them. And there would be the working with other subsystems, three dimension, and then focusing on person of the therapist or person of the worker. I'm not going to run through all of them in view of time. I shall be focusing on the basic principles today. And that has got to do with joining. And a principle we call families are wrong, externalizing the symptom. And the third principle is family certainty is the enemy of change. So let me run through these principles with you while leaving the other techniques and the way to work with subsystems and person of the worker or person of the therapist aside. Let's look at the first principle, joining. For those who uh, are familiar with structural family therapy or systemic family therapy, you know, joining is almost like engagement, engaging the community, engaging the family, or even joining with an individual. It is not a skill or a technique only. It is very much a mindset constructed out of respect, empathy, curiosity, and a commitment to working with communities, families to heal them. It happens from the very beginning of the contact with the community or the family that you work with to the very, very end. And through this connection, the worker engages the family and the community to support, to challenge, and definitely to heal, especially in a time like COVID-19. You may be working with adolescents. You may be working with uh, older people in a nursing home. You may be working with families that have just experienced violence. Now, the principle two, it's about families are wrong. It sounds interesting to say, or oh, the communities are wrong. What do we mean? Now, often our, our clients get in contact with us. They need help because they have a limited view of their situation. They run out of resources. They don't have the financial needs. So this principle challenges them that they are wrong because of the way they know, because of the way they behave in a certain way that they know they are in trouble. And they think their reality or the situation that there are no alternatives to their situation or their stories. So in that sense, we are challenging them. No, this is not what it is. There are possibilities, there are alternatives, there are resources. So oftentimes, be it a family or a community has an ingrained perception that the problem relates to a particular situation, usually is tied to an individual. It's because of his lack of motivation, his lack of, uh, he's too lazy or he doesn't want to change. Right? Rather than the situation may be maintained actually by the entire family or related communities. So we enter with this principle that the problem is not just an individual problem, but a, a problem or a situation that may be related to the behaviors of others that maintained it. So this is what principle two, families or communities are wrong when we are very fixated with a certain way of thinking. So when we are fixated or the communities or the families are fixated, then we will use fewer resources that could be made available that they already have or they have been trapped in not accessing. Let's look at the third principle that when we are too certain, be it a family, individual or community, it becomes the enemy of change. Now, the more people maintain their certainty about their problems, 
the less open they are to viewing the situation differently and less likely are they to alter their ways of being with one another. So in other words, it's basically being very stubborn and it could happen to social workers. Your certain way of seeing families, your certain ways of seeing communities can, when you maintain a certain certainty about the assessment, this can also be rather dangerous. So the workers may be uncertain, so to as to what the problem is, but they know it can be viewed from a wider lens rather than a microscope or a zoom in focus that the family or community are using. So in other words, as workers, we are trying to provide another alternative way of seeing the, pro the problem or the situation. Now in summary, because of time, I'm not going to uh, illustrate with the uh, cases that have been seen together with PACE for the past half a year, as well as some of the child abuse cases that I'm reviewing with Fei Yue. Um, I think it is important to us for us to move toward a safe uncertainty attitude or position as we emerge from COVID and keep our thinking and our attitude evolving and open. And one specific suggestion I would like to make is the use of technology and telehealth. In that, for example, in PAVE, when we are seeing cases, I would have a, a worker seeing the case together with me on Zoom. The worker would have the Zoom linked to Teams, Microsoft Teams, and there are about 15 sometimes or more social workers, psychologists watching how we work. The clients agree to it and have been duly informed. And we will get a break. The family will then have a break. Then we will go back to the team and have a discussion. And after about 15, 30 minutes, we will come back to the family and share with the family what the entire team of 15, 20 workers think by giving them the feedback. And we have also learned when working on Zoom, for example, there are a lot of nitty gritties, like for example, the Wi-Fi strengths, whether the family should be sitting together in one, one using one handful, and then there are a lot of uh, nitty gritties that we work with them. Um, and moving on, I think many of our families and clients would prefer having a hybrid mode, but this would pose a lot of challenges. For example, we are using structural family therapy. When we are doing an enactment, where we get the family members to talk. When we are using Zoom, we have very different way of using an enactment. Sometimes the worker and I, we will switch off our camera for the family to talk, even though we are present and they know we are present. But that's a very interesting way that we would not be able to do if we have the family in the counseling room or in the therapy room. And when using Zoom, we find that there is this attraction and we are beginning to discover a lot more. So we will continue to ev evaluate and listen to the clients as we adopt a safe, uncertain position. For example, every... Hi. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, could we request that you uh, wrap up maybe in one minute so we have uh, time for the other panelists as well? Sure. So we would use um, a, uh, what we call a session rating scale, where we ask our clients after every session. And we will be able to listen to our clients where they would tell us what has been useful for them, uh, the approach to being used, if we have been respectful, and what was the overall experience. So this is basically a very important point. One of our speakers will be talking about uh, from beyond social services, and I'm looking forward to that presentation too, where we actually need to learn to listen to our clients more. These are my references. That's my presentation. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Timothy, for the presentation. Uh, thank you for reminding us the key principles from the therapist pouch 
it can help better help us to engage with families and communities. And also, uh, thank you for sharing your reflections on the use of Zoom, especially when conducting sessions with families. Yeah. All right, up next, uh, let us welcome uh, Dr. Art uh, Maulot. Uh, we are very happy to have a researcher from the healthcare sector here today. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, Dr. Art Maulot. Um, Dr. Art is a cultural anthropologist and senior research fellow at the Center for Aging Research and Education um, at the Duke and US Medical School. Art's research focuses on translating cultural concepts of health and aging into effective programs and policies. He believes in the empowerment of older persons by amplifying their stories and advocating for an inclusive, compassionate and just society for all ages. In this presentation, Art will highlight the needs of older persons and their caregivers during the pandemic. In essence, what lessons can be learned and applied in the way our society supports vulnerable older persons in this new normal? What new normal standards of care should our society aspire to so that these older persons can continue to age with dignity and not be left behind? Everyone, please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Art Maldor. Thank you, Robin, for that um, brilliant short introduction. So let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Is it my presentation slide? All right. So. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at Duke NUS and I think during the pandemic, I'm going to talk more about the research that we did and my presentation focused more on the perspectives from older persons and also their caregivers. So the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerabilities of older persons in terms of their experiences with social isolation and loneliness, their access to health and social care services, and also caregiving needs. So this presentation consolidates findings across several qualitative evaluation projects to look at the understanding of family as the first line of support and highlight needs of older persons and caregivers during the pandemic. Um, basically, at the end of the presentation, I want us to kind of think about and reflect, you know, what standards of care should our society aspire to achieve so that our vulnerable and socially disadvantaged communities can thrive and age with dignity and not be left behind. There has been wide coverage in the news about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health and social isolation, particularly on older persons. So I'm not going to go through with it, but just a general sense that this is not something new that emerges just from my data. During the pandemic, and like many other research centers, our research activities were very much affected. We had five studies that were ongoing throughout the pandemic, some right in the middle of the circuit breaker in 2020, and heightened alerts throughout 2021. We have interviewed close to 200 older persons and caregivers in the past two years. It has been a challenging climate to conduct research. We are exhausted, and so were our participants. About 75% of our participants live in public rental flats. Most have no active phone lines, smart devices, or video conferencing apps, so alternative modes of data collection were not feasible. Everything had to be conducted in person. We've had an average about 80% rejections uh, to participate in our research, and that's an unprecedented rate. The things we used to do to build rapport with our research participants, such as community engagement, research outreach, home visits, we couldn't do these things. We had to actually sell our research over the phone, and I would train my research assistants to pretend they're selling vacuum cleaners, uh, which is what I used to do before being in research, over the phone. And how do we make our research interesting so that our older persons feel that they are motivated to participate and contribute to research and also to have their voices be heard. Also, at this time, older persons are also very wary of scams and we've been mistaken as such quite a bit. So by the time it was deemed safe for us to go into the community and interview our participants, we also found a lot of changes. Some no longer live there, they have moved to the nursing home, some have passed on, or their conditions have deteriorated so much that they were no longer eligible to be interviewed. But with the 200 that we managed to speak to, we learned a lot about how the pandemic affected them. So during the circuit breaker, the older persons we spoke to had continued access to home personal care, so these are essential, such as housekeeping, meals being deliv delivered, as well as food rations. 
those who are in need of post-surgery care had access to home nursing. In fact, some elders, especially those with more complex health and social issues, mentioned that they felt well taken care of by the staff from the senior activity centres. There were more calls to check in, they got their meals and groceries delivered to them, neighbours helping to run errands, services and support they should have had access to in a non-pandemic situation but made more possible only during the pandemic. Disruptions were mostly most severely felt in terms of home therapy, activities at the senior activity center. Um, people were very unhappy about having their exercising, tea time, newspaper reading taken away from them. Having doctor's appointment cancelled was also a frustrating experience since it's actually hard to get one in the first place. And there were concerns about how they're managing their own health, especially in these times of uncertainty. Worse, some cancellations were also done via letters, and even if seniors check the letters, they can't read, and the SAC is closed during that time, so no one can help them decipher what's in the letter. Telehealth, as we are transi transitioning into now, were not offered, or if offered, elders were unable to access. When the circuit breaker was lifted, it was hard for some of the participants to keep up with changing regulations. One person said, I want to go out, also cannot, cannot do anything right. Everything also cannot, but no choice lah for our benefit. Most times they had to wait for instructions about what they can or cannot do. Some would just walk by the, the SAC hoping to you know, enter, only to be told that there can be a maximum of two or five persons at a time. So they just say hi and go on their way. Um, it's really mainly just to see another human being and to just interact with another human being. Home-based services such as checking blood pressure um, are provided at the SACs, but there are, there are limited slots and advanced booking was needed. And also because of split team arrangements uh, in terms of staffing at the SAC, it was hard for elders to speak to staff and it, it appears as if no one is in the office. Some found it even more difficult to get appointments at the clinic, but despite all these challenges, there were also those who also felt that services were ramped up during the pandemic compared to before. This also includes higher levels of client engagement, uh, regular phone calls to check in, free medication delivery, and to cut down on unnecessary commute for seniors. The impact on social isolation and participation was more pronounced, actually, on those who are more socially active and mobile or relatively healthy, compared to those who already experienced isolation and marginalization prior to the pandemic, due to the factors mentioned here. Functional health limitations, they can't walk or stand up very long, so they're used to not going out anyway. They have complex chronic illnesses, which limits their daily activities. They do not have money to go out and hang out with friends. They are very dependent on care. So having others to help them out during the pandemic was business as usual. They have limited or no family and social support. So having no family visits was also nothing out of the ordinary. So these groups of older persons, they have grown accustomed to being forgotten or excluded from the many years spent withdrawing from, from social activities to avoid being judged as poor, lazy, or a beggar. So staying at home and being confined because of their health and social issues or being trapped like a bird in a cage, as one gentleman told me, was nothing new. The circuit breaker, in fact, made some of them feel like they were like the rest of society, having to stay in to be safe because there was no other choice. In no way am I suggesting that we should revisit the circuit breaker if it, help, if it helps the more frail and vulnerable seniors feel included in our society. But what I'm trying to say here is that not being able to go out and seek social interactions bear different implications for diverse groups of older persons. There were some elders who suffered during the circuit breaker because they were not able to play golf and meet friends at the country club. And then we also have those who had to put up with abusive co-tenants because they can't go out. The pandemic accentuates and makes visible social and health inequalities that we now cannot unsee. With the safe reopening and safe transition phases, environmental barriers become even more challenging for some older persons. What used to be barrier-free access is now exacerbated by blocked or restricted entrances and exits in shopping malls, for example. Seniors may have to walk further to enter buildings and resting spots are difficult with social distancing. Some vaccination centers are also not accommodating needs of the more frail, lack of comfortable seating or waiting areas, narrow corners that are difficult for wheelchair users, and instructions are mostly in English. One of the impacts that's left less emphasized, 
is the importance of religious and leisure activities to older person's self-esteem, physical and mental health. Muslim men spoke about feeling less complete as an individual because they were unable to carry out, carry out Friday prayers, while a caregiver shared that her father used to hike at Bukit Timah. But after the circuit breaker and with that long period of sedentary activity, her father is now not able to walk between two bus stops, that's about 200 meters, without having to sit down to catch his breath. He is also now physically weaker. What saddens me also was stories from two or three individuals that we spoke to who said that only a lockdown makes it possible for them to justify to relevant agencies that they are in need of safer housing away from abusive co-tenants. Which brings us to the next point. There's a strong assumption in the media that home is a safe place for older persons. But our interviews with older persons living in public rental flats show a different story. Some recall the boredom and anxiety they felt about not knowing what's going on outside and leading to feelings about going crazy at home. They emphasize the claustrophobia about being confined to very small living space, which is hot and stuffy. One man stressed about having to pay more for utility bills because he had to turn on the fan all the time to keep cool compared to sitting outside. Another SAC staff shared with us that she had to write letters of appeal because her members were getting fined for breaching safe protocols because they, they did not know they could not be outside or gather in a group. During this time as well in the um, post-circuit breaker, I was also asked by a local radio station to comment on older people being stubborn. Not every older person has access to the same information, understands it, or updated with changes. The same with vaccine hesitation. Some of our participants are concerned that COVID vaccines contradict their current medication, also because they were initially rejected for vaccination. So what Dr. Timothy was saying previously, um, the thing about older persons and vaccination is not about rights not to be vaccinated, but their logic is embedded in fear and uncertainty. The pandemic also necessitated swift ramping up of digital access and infrastructure for older persons due to transition of services and activities from physical to online. Some of these challenges have been acknowledged, such as poor digital literacy and access to internet or devices for older persons. But less considered is difficulties such as vision, hearing, and poor hand grip that makes the use of such devices difficult. While there are also mobile access plans for seniors, there's also a strict eligibility, eligibility criteria, uh, which is you got to be um, 60 and above, you should have access to Comcare, LTA or SMTA or you're on the public rental scheme. And then you also have to attend the Seniors Go Digital Learning Program. This is also a two years mobile plan, $5 a month. But as we know with initiatives like this, what happens after two years? Who will assist with renewing the plan? Another issue is a complicated booking system for appointments, telemedicine, and also places of worship. The interfaces are seldom elderly friendly. As for telemedicine, older persons with cognitive issues may have trouble grappling with the idea of a doctor talking behind the screen. A, a caregiver shared that she had to remind her father that it was a teleconsult and not a YouTube video because he was trying to change the video. Care issues are also challenged by safety protocols in the hospital and community. First, it affects caregivers of loved ones with complex needs. Um, caregivers are not allowed access to the A&E awards, and some of them may actually require uh, two people. Uh, two, re two caregivers are required to be present for appointments, especially for those with more intense needs. Uh, but with no caregivers allowed or only one caregiver allowed, it makes it difficult to manage. So caregivers express concerns also for elders who are non-verbal, bedridden, and with cognitive impairment. So if no other family member is allowed in the wards, who will advocate for the patient? So communication is severely impacted. Hospital staff are burdened with high, case, high case loads, and updates tend to be sporadic. Older persons may not even have the phones to update their family members about their condition. In this way, patient-centered care is compromised. Appointments cancelled or delayed uh, were delayed because they were deemed less important. Uh, therapy, for example, speech therapy, which is really important because it's about um, rehab for uh, stroke patients to learn how to do normal activities like swallowing. Uh, these were deemed low priority and access to maintenance rehab is limited. So this affects you know, the physical conditioning of older persons. 
So there were also concerns about who will take care of my loved one. Say, if caregivers got COVID or health risk warning, uh, they expressed concerns about having to self-isolate or quarantine when there's no alternative carers. As for the impact on caregiving as well, caregivers highlighted deterioration in physical activity levels and cognitive well-being of their loved ones due to disruptions in services and care routines. The caregivers we spoke to also experienced poor mental health. Some avoided socializing with friends because they were very paranoid in these uncertain times that they may infect their loved ones. As a result, they feel more isolated and stressed as the usual activities for respite were not available. What we also learned from this um, experience or doing research with caregivers is that the, of the unequal distribution of caregiving responsibilities becoming further heightened. Family members were already hands off. Um, they are able to justify their lack of involvement, especially during the circuit breaker and um, the pandemic. They are, the caregivers are also unable to bring their care recipients to visit other family members or they have to limit the number of visitors per household. So this results in limited respite as well. There's also unfairness about who gets to spend time with care recipients. And daughters mentioned it's normally sons who are more privileged because they seldom see the older persons um, and, and they are more prized than daughters. So that's why uh, there's always this sense of injustice. I take care of mom, but my brother gets to see her more than I do. But what we also found is that Caregiving um, burden affects sons more during the pandemic because these are the, the, the caregivers who rely on family ecosystem for support more than daughters who were already primarily involved in caregiving by themselves pre-pandemic. The pandemic reveals hidden disparities in terms of digital literacy, already isolated older persons, unequal access to information, getting services that are needed, environmental, bar environmental barriers that we can no longer ignore. So person-centered care as well is a buzzword in our regional health systems. But we also noted how regulation supersedes the needs of patients and caregivers during the, during the pandemic. So this is about reflecting on the balance between safety and without compromising care. We also observe differences in terms of care respite especially for those who had a strong family care ecosystem. Meanwhile, coping strategies that were already limited became worse during the pandemic. Caregivers experienced increased isolation and also increased caregiving responsibilities. The good thing, however, that came out of the pandemic, as our elders inform us, is the capacity the community has for compassion and empathy towards older persons. They notice that young people are more proactive at helping them and more respectful compared to pre-pandemic. And neighbors were also more friendly, helping with food delivery and groceries. As researchers, the pandemic offered some valuable lessons. First, the viability of family as a first line of support needs to be reconsidered. We can no longer assume that family members are able to support older person's needs. The pandemic gave family members who are already hands off, you know, reasons not to be involved. Further, looking at the closure, how the closure of SACs affected our participants and um, for needs to age in place, it's the community rather than family that is the first line of support. When the family is seen as the first line of support, we also noted contradictions. Uh, there is limited flexibility to allow the many helping hands, for example, to provide support for family members to care for the loved ones at the hospital, for instance. So in terms of social inclusion for older persons, we find that there is consideration for marginalized for the marginalized only when it affects the rest of us. For example, only for the vaccination, we see dialect materials coming up. And this is not a usual mode of communication. The ramp up of, the ramp up of digital, digital literacy and access was also catalyzed by center closures and social activities for older persons. So in moving towards new normal standards, we need to rethink normativity. Who should need center around? Whose needs are prioritized? We should avoid painting whole categories of people with the same brush. We exclude groups of people when we design with the assumption of able-bodiedness, for example. Protocols are important, but there should be accommodation and flexibility for those with diverse and complex needs. So in prioritizing who deserves care, we need to focus on needs.
rather than means, test, means testing, which does not take into account complex family dynamic and live realities. We also need to focus on needs rather than adhering to protocols that actually compromise care. So I look forward to discussing more during the panel. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ad Amalud. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you for highlighting the impact of the pandemic on the lives of the older persons and their families and challenging our assumptions, uh, the assumptions that we might have about these older persons and their families. Do they uh, really have adequate living spaces in a public rental flat when it comes to safe distancing? Are they really safer at home? And is the family as the first line of support or, or, or it is the community that has to step in first in times of the pandemic? All right, thank you. And before we move on to the next two presentations, I'd like to invite the audience to pose their questions uh, using the Zoom Q&A function. All right, so if you haven't done so, you may, may do so. Um, later on, um, after the next two presentations, we will consolidate the questions and invite um, our speakers to comment and discuss. Okay, um, I'll move on. So up next, uh, we have uh, two more presentations on this panel. Um, let's welcome uh, a social worker and a community worker from the AMK FSC Community Services. Uh, first, let me introduce to you Ms. Adriana Rasip. Um, she is an asset-based community-driven development practitioner, ABCD for short. Adriana believes that communities are rich in assets that can be tapped on to come up with their own solutions towards their collective well-being. The future that she envisions for the social service sector is to see beneficiaries as potentials instead of mere recipients. To this end, Adriana is passionate about creating spaces that engages beneficiaries as citizens so that they can step forward to contribute and have a voice. Her colleague, uh, Ms. Peck Yen Chan, is a social worker. Um, she works with children and adults from low-income families. She believes that by discovering and highlighting the family's strengths, can enable them to recognize their potential. And this can create different experiences for these families as they continue to work through their day-to-day -day struggles. Uh, both Adriana and Yen Zan are presenting on the lessons learned from the setting up of the new 643 Community Hub in Amon Kyo. This presentation is a combination of insights shared by the different stakeholders on how they can come together during the pandemic to create an enabling environment for the community co-creation to happen. Uh, please join me to welcome Ms. Andrena and Yen Zan. All right, thank you so much, Robin. Yeah, we'll share the screen. Okay. All right, so hi everyone, good morning. Um, so I'm Adriana and together my colleague Yen Zan, today we'll be sharing more about our community building experience working with low-income families in the Amokyo neighbourhood. Uh, and here today we are advocating for a more sustainable model of community development moving forward. So as community work practitioners, uh, we believe that community building work has a place in the social service ecosystem and that it's important to build communities that are connected so as to create ecosystems of care that look out for the vulnerable in the neighbourhood. So the question that we aim to answer through our sharing, we want to give some insights, is how can we as social service practitioners work alongside the community to strengthen and also co-create the ecosystem of care to ensure that everyone is looked after and can thrive in the neighbourhood. So when we talk about you know, community work, especially within the FSC or family service context, um, you know, usually the model of you know, community outreach, working with formal stakeholders, increasing awareness of services might come to your mind. Right? Typically, that's the type of community work that uh, FSC does. However, the community work model that we are advocating for and what EMK FSC is also working towards is a model... Okay, it's a model that is participatory, collaborative, and also resident-led. So instead of professionals as experts making the decision, we are advocating for a model where residents or citizens, including beneficiaries, are able to make decisions on what is good for the neighborhood as experts of their own lives and also the community. With professionals like myself and Yen Zan um, stepping back and supporting these initiatives. So this is, uh, just to give some a bit of a context, this was an approach that EMK FSC has started to embark on and move towards in 2019, before the pandemic even. And, but you know, somehow the pandemic came and then further catalyzed the process of this community building that we're moving towards. So 
So this on this on, on, on this slide here, the diagram is called the um, helpers crossroads. So this is a sort of like a concept in asset based community development. It maps out the positioning of the helper vis-a-vis -vis the beneficiaries that they are working with. So in line with the community building model for community work to be um, participatory, collaborative, and resident-led, uh, as practitioners, instead of doing things to and for beneficiaries, how do we explore inviting the contribution of members? So we call beneficiaries members based on the assets and talents that they have. How do we also create platforms for members to contribute, to have a voice, and be change agents to co-create initiatives that will be good for the well-being of the neighbourhood? So it's about doing together with and ultimately members feeling empowered to do things by themselves collectively. So the next new, the next few community um, initiatives in the Amukin neighborhood will show you how members were mobilized as contributors and change agents in looking out for the community during the pandemic. And also I'll show how the positioning of professionals such as myself and Jensen, how we work together with the community members to do this. Okay, so this is Project Goodwill Raya Cookie. So it's a community work initiative during um, High Raya. Because if you remember, in Circuit Baker in 2020, it coincided with the High Raya period. So um, this Project Goodwill Raya Cookies is an initiative where community members, including low-income beneficiaries, came together in contactless ways, creative contactless ways to spread joy and also foster connections among the community. Um, you know, beneficiaries who run home-based businesses and, you know, food delivery riders leverage on their skills to plan the initiative and connect the neighbours during the COVID-19 circuit breaker um, by baking and also delivering, delivering the cookies in conjunction with the festive period. So social service practitioners like myself, we stepped back and we created this space for the community members to plan and contribute ideas on how the initiative could work, also taking into consideration all the safety restrictions during COVID-19. And then interestingly, the, the delivery riders also went on to form a community riders group, which is still ongoing up until today. So it's a collective that helps to deliver food items or groceries to those who are not able to go out of their house because of exposure to the virus or they have limited mobility. Uh, and also the community take a chance to check in on the neighbours who might need support or are isolated and lonely. Uh, and this creates an ecosystem of care to look out for the vulnerable or people who um, you know, are limited in the neighbourhood. So the, interestingly, the same group of community members invited more members into the group, grew the group and came together to plan the back to school initiative. So the members came up with this because they observed uh, in their neighborhood that some neighbors might have some challenges in you know, meeting the needs of a back to school item or getting back to school item for the children in the next school year. So they got together, planned, fundraised and procured school items from local shops uh, and home-based businesses selling school items and planned all the distribution all on their own. So all of these efforts are actually resident-led and um, again, my role as a community worker is to step back and to support this initiative. So agency saw these community efforts and they wanted to further enhance and multiply community building work in, an, in creating an ecosystem of care within the neighbourhood. So the community work team, EMKFSC, received an opportunity to utilise the space as a community hub. Um, which we hope can be a platform and catalyst to further enhance community building efforts to foster more connections, invite more contributions and also encourage mutual help in the community. So in the process of setting up the space, we have also had learning conversations together with community members. So the question that we asked was, you know, what would you like to see in the community and how can this space be a means to do that? Um, so, you know, one example, someone brought up at, you know, she would like to see more study places, places in the community because children, you know, from, um, from, from low-income backgrounds might not have a space to study at home or might not have stable Wi-Fi and having a study space or area might be important. It's important actually to ensure a conducive environment for a child to study. Um, and the members also brought up about food being a way to bring people together and you know, there's also many good cooks in the neighborhood and there's a lot of families doing cooking as a home-based business. So having a kitchenette in the place is also a good platform for contribution, leveraging on existing skills of um, you know, members. Now, so as you can see, this is the um, conversations, the process of conversation that we had, we had to do in small groups because there were restrictions. Yeah, so and, and as you can see, um, not only conversations, uh, community members together with the staff, we literally built the space together, you know, from the building of the table, you know, setting up the IKEA furniture, setting up the space, uh, and, and in a way, it also fosters some shared ownership of the 643 community space. 
And because we also value the voice of community members, we also engage community members as paid locums at the 643 Community Hub. Uh, so these people are connectors with lived experience that will be able to grow this community of contributors and mutual help. And in, in today's conference also, we have our two locums together with us to attend and um, you know, listen into this sharing. Yeah, um, okay, so after that, I'm going to hand the time over to my colleague, Yen Zan, who will be talking more about what are the, some of the lessons that we've learned from our community building experience. Yen Zan, over to you. Diana. So, um, yes, yeah, I'm Yen Zan. So, yeah, as you look back at the experience and how you adapted community work as the pandemic transpired and how we eventually managed to set up the 643 Community Hub, um, we thought it was important for us to focus on the process um, or how this was made possible. So we spoke to uh, people from our management, the staff, and also residents um, to find out how the experience has been for them. Yeah, so through the conversations, we consolidated our takeaways um, that made this possible into three main lessons learned, which I will share with you guys shortly. So lesson one. Lesson one is um, power sharing with community. So talking about community, we are referring to um, be it between management and staff and also between staff and residents. So it was key for us to create intentional platform to co-create and make decisions jointly. So I know that you know it is a very normal or quite uh, normal for us as practitioners to want to jump in to fix things when we see problems arise. Yeah, but it was also about recognizing that community members are experts of their own lives and they have intimate understanding of their own community to what kind of solutions might best address the issues that has arised. Rather than professionals coming from a more privileged position and making and potentially imposing decisions on them, um, hearing their voices is important. Yeah, so how we incorporate this in the community building process is that we, in the setting up of the 643 Community Hub, we include them in the conversation, like what Adriana has shared earlier. We hear our residents' hopes to have dedicated areas for children and youth to engage them. We also spoke to children, you know, and we also hear from them that they want a relaxation area um, in the community hub with puppets and things like this. So we do um, consider all these inputs and it has come to fruition in the setting up of the community hub. So this process also showed us that it is important that professionals unlearn traditional ways of taking on the expert role and take on a more collaborative stance to enable the process of co-creation and joint decision making to happen. So when we allow people who are typically marginalized to have a voice, in a way we are sharing power with them. Yeah. So lesson two is about taking risks, embracing uncertainty and trusting the process. So actually when the pandemic hit, I think most of us are confined at home. Uh, and even till now, actually we are not able to run our activities and programs like how we used to pre-COVID. So we saw ourselves, you know, staff and um, residents included, trying out and thinking out of the box to wanting to try out different ways of doing community work. So like how case work sessions are run, um, community meetings and gatherings are also shifted online. Yeah, so uh, discussions were done over Zoom, WhatsApp calls, etc. Yeah, so we had the we had the honor and the opportunity to work with Uniqlo when they approached us, you know, to uh, provide pre-loved clothes for our residents in Ang uh, We knew that you know the conventional way of give and take format wouldn't be as effective with all the safe uh, management measures and regulations in place. So the residents and staff, we came together and then we really thought about how can we work around all these um, new, all these new uh, measures that are in place. And the idea of moving this format onto Facebook Live came about. Yeah, and when we are able to gain a bigger reach of residents while keeping to all these safety measures uh, in view of the pandemic. So you can, as you can see in the picture, so it's a screenshot of uh, the Facebook Live that is hosted by one of our residents. And um, on, on top, you know, the, the picture above is actually the area that we initially set up for the give and take. Yeah. So this is also, so this was very unconventional, even as professionals, it's a very different way of doing things. But we knew that we needed to find creative solution and think out of the box. And this is actually made possible because our management also recognized the value in doing this. Um, they saw the value in allocating resources, manpower for us to run the Facebook Live with our residents and giving the green light for us to create the Facebook account um, on Facebook to do this live. Yeah, so this allows the team to experiment with all these um, new ideas that come up. 
and inside we didn't know how the life would turn out. Yeah, but I think it's also about management giving us the trust and us, you know, really just trusting the process um, and not so fixated about um, looking at the instant uh, outcome of things. So this actually deviates from the conventional focus on outcome when we run programs and activities, but more on the process. So thirdly, the lesson learned that we gathered from this experience is to start small. So we thought the analogy of a ripple accurately represents this process. So uh, we held on to the belief that shift in the mindset starts with a small action and followed by trusting the process to allow the multiplier effect to take place. So actually, the, this whole uh, initiative started with just um, three or four community work, social workers who are keen to do community work. Yeah, and the management was okay with just having a small team to kickstart certain initiatives. The team then took on a more strength-based approach when they work with residents and beneficiaries. So while the conversation become more strength-based, it doesn't mean that we dismiss the challenges that um, our beneficiaries face. Rather, we want to explore how the community, how the bigger community can be mobilized to address all these challenges that arise. So the team then gathered a small group of residents and ben beneficiaries to take on um, certain initiatives together. We gradually have more residents on board um, and eventually we then see, you know, in December, like what Adriana shared, our residents um, taking on the ownership and having more confidence to propose um, this initiative on their own, which is a back to school initiative. So we see how this process unfolded, you know, in the, in the timeline that you see um, on the screen right now. And it really begin from starting small. Yeah, so we saw value in sharing these lessons learned because as we work alongside community and witness, we do witness the community impact, uh, the collective impact on the community, whereby they take more ownership and they gain the confidence to address the issue they observe in the neighborhood and in the estate that they are in. We also saw how community work has significant impact on individuals and we want to take today's uh, opportunity to share um, the story of Madam R. So Madam R has been a long-term uh, beneficiary of the FSC. Yeah, and she has been working with her social worker on her mental health and family issues um, all this while. And she's also an active member of the community hub since um, you know, the community effort started in AMK FSC. So Madam R, we actually spoke to her, um, you know, to also understand a little bit more how this process has been for her. And she actually shared that as she involves herself in community work, she noticed herself depending on her caseworker or social worker less. You know, she, she shared with us that previously she would, you know, call her social worker multiple times a week for emotional support, but she has observed herself doing less of this. And um, even though she recognized, yeah, her issues are not going away anytime soon. Um, but with her engagement and her, you know, active uh, participation in the community hub, she finds that it actually days are getting by easier. She then feels less depressed and she feels more connected with the community and also the people around her. Yeah, so Madam, our story really got us thinking about how community work could potentially become an intervention for, for beneficiaries or casework. You know, this is for practitioners who are more familiar with this term. Um, so think about how you know having residents to support social workers in supporting families in need. Uh, for example, during the COVID-19 um, situation right now, families may be confined at home. They may not be able to go out of their house to purchase groceries or even buy meals. Um, can we then activate someone in the community um, to, to help with this, especially on the weekends when FSC is not operating? Could we then also have work groups formed by residents in the community to address, to address challenges such as family violence, or even having people with lived experience to participate in policy dialogues? So could social service practitioners like us, especially those who are situated in the neighborhoods, continue to think of ways to integrate community work into the core work that we do? And we hope to end off our segment with three food for thought. Yeah, so firstly, how can more platforms be intentionally created for voices of communities to be heard or power to be shared so that joint decisions can be made? Secondly, how can management and funding structures be more enabling of experimentation and innovation as a way to address unique challenges brought about by unexpected changes or events? Last and most importantly, in your capacity as a practitioner, policymaker, manager, etc., what are some things you would need to unlearn 
and we learn to enable citizen participation and co-creation. What are some small steps you can take to, to move towards this shift? Yeah, so with that, we have come to the end of our presentation. You know, we welcome any questions, you know, in, to our emails or later in the panel discussion. Thank you for having us. And, you know, we wish everyone a happy social work day and, you know, have a fruitful conference ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Adriana and Yen San. I think it is encouraging to see the slew of community initiatives by the community, for the community, in times like this, when most of us are actually confined to our own homes due to the many containment measures. Yeah, so, uh, and I can see from, you know, the questions that have been coming in, there's a lot of excitement in the work that you do. Oh, all right, so before we get to that, uh, let's welcome our last speaker on the panel today, uh, Ms. Renganayaki Sengavelu, the Deputy Executive Director of Beyond Social Services. Yeah, uh, let me introduce uh, Renga to you. Renga is also a registered social worker trained in community development, restorative justice, and stakeholder engagement. Through her work at Beyond, Ranga is committed to engage families living in public rental housing so that they can exercise their strengths and capabilities in addressing the issues they face. This not only helps the families, it enables neighborhoods to become villages um, to raise their children well. In her work, Ranga aspires to engage more people in peace building efforts to create a society that is kinder, fairer, and more cooperative. So in a similar vein, her presentation today will be focused on how can we structure a society that is more equal post-pandemic and how can professionals uh, make space for the voices of the worst hit to be heard. Everyone, please welcome Ranga. Thank you, Robin. Uh, as I was listening to Adriana and uh, her colleagues speak, I was thinking, you know, it feels like we're all working in the same, uh, we are in the same sector, but it also feels like we're working in the same uh, agency. And I'm really happy that it has uh, transformed to this uh, in terms of community development and community engagement. So I want to make a couple of disclaimers as I speak. So as I speak, I'm speaking about the work, the hard work that my colleagues have actually put in along with the community members. So I am not on the ground as much as my colleagues, but I'm here to share the good work that they've done. The others that I wanted to share is that this is purely beyond social services experience. And uh, whether it's replicable, whether it is sustainable, it depends on the stance that we as uh, community workers and social workers uh, take in terms of recognizing the strengths of uh, communities. Uh, so, you know, people ask me, how can we make this sustainable? And I say, it really depends on you and uh, how you engage a community. Uh, and uh, ideally today, it would have been a member of our community who's here to share whether what we are doing has actually impacted them, whether they've actually had the ground, uh, being given the ground to hear their voices uh, more loudly, but uh, we are not there yet. But what we do on a continual basis is to seek feedback on whether we are being helpful. Uh, we can be doing a lot of things that we think are helping, but are we being helpful? So uh, I hope to see in a, in a, maybe in the next uh, seminar for Social Work Day, that it will be, this panel will be filled with members who are telling us, giving us feedback as social workers on what we are doing. So these are some of the things, uh, thoughts I had as I was listening to the various presentations and my own as I reviewed my slides. So I wanted to say that the impact of COVID as it was pointed out by the other speakers was, uh, actually exacerbated the living conditions of those in the low income. Uh, these conditions existed prior and it became worse during uh, COVID-19. And we identified a few areas that we thought we could be most helpful in uh, to address some of these things that came up. The higher cost of living. So, you know, initially all the uh, supermarket shelves were cleared because people were hoarding and uh, our families were left with little of low cost uh, groceries to buy. There was food insecurity, there was work care conflicts, employment uh, being affected by the pandemic. And uh, one clear area that really needed our support was children and youth who had to cope with the uh, digital learning space and uh, home-based learning. So these were ongoing challenges that we were seeing prior and it just became worse and prominent for us as members. Uh, we call our, our community members as members, not as clients, uh, fed back to us the challenges uh, that they were facing. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of literature out there. We have Beyond has also done a couple of studies, which is on our research website. Uh, you can read uh, this particular one, which is from the Singapore Economic Review as well, to look at how this is not only Singapore-based, but it's actually regional, uh, worldwide, uh, how the low-income communities were affected. 
Uh, so we had this plan of uh, a three R plan: uh, response, recovery, and rebuilding. It wasn't something like you know uh, that, that it emerged. So we didn't go into COVID-19 uh, with this uh, 3R in mind, but it emerged as we were working on it. And it's not so neat as well and not so linear as it is put here. So we felt that response was imminent. It, it had to be done because people were facing a lot of challenges on the ground. Then we had to focus on recovery and rebuilding. And we are still somewhere in between the recovery rebuilding space. And we have not come to the end of the pandemic, as we all know. So the four areas as we, we identified was uh, food assistance, financial support, uh, connectivity and digital devices and employment. So very neat, right? Response, recovery and rebuilding. As we started the work, uh, so this is some, some of the things that we did uh, in, in response to the pandemic. And we felt that, you know, it really had to be like a aid that we are providing to the communities. So the food assistance for, uh, for one, sorry, let me go back. The food assistance was actually initially distributing cooked meals. Uh, which became the food rations and then later it became supermarket vouchers because we realized we had to develop more muscles to continue giving food rations and uh, families actually requested for food uh, vouchers which we took the feedback and then we fed back to our sponsors to say that families want the choice of what they eat they do not want to be imposed with the kind of cooked meals that were being offered but the cooked meals were also then paired with food rations and supermarket vouchers because there were restaurants that were coming in, there were other agencies that were coming in to provide the cooked meals. When it came to financial assistance, our very first attempt is to link them to existing resources out there. As a smaller agency, we did not have unlimited resources to support with the financial assistance. We did uh, have a lot of sponsors who came in that we were able to provide temporary relief to families, uh, but we were also linking them back to SSO, and other sources of funding out there. And we started dispersing $300 to $500 a month over three months. We formed a collective with other agencies as well uh, when more funds were received so that we could reach more people on the ground. Internet connectivity, as you know, was mainly devices. And uh, of course, the, the fact that uh, people did not have sufficient funds and sufficient space for learning. And we tried to do our best to uh, support them with resources and employment support, linking members to income generation projects. So I titled this slide as response to because we are in a period of crisis and we are just providing and doing. But as the crisis progressed, what happened was we looked at it as recovery with. And this is what it looked like. So when we say recovery with the members that we are working with, then we are listening to who is most impacted, right? So that uh, participatory research became part of it. So how this happened is as people, as we were engaging members, as members were being referring other neighbors to us for the financial assistance, we started uh, a research uh, process where we were also asking them questions about how are they being impacted, how are they coping and so on. And we started collating this data uh, for those who said they would like to participate. And what we did was we also identified local community members to be community enablers so that they could identify other residents in the community who need our support. So we don't claim to know everyone in the community. New families have moved in, others are, are kind of going under the radar, but those living in the neighborhoods knew exactly what was needed. So what we did then was to bring together circles like what Adriana pointed out, circles of people mainly on WhatsApp because we could not meet them face to face and form these WhatsApp groups. And I think we have so many WhatsApp groups now that people are uh, our community workers spend a lot of time monitoring these groups and responding to them because there's a lot of information and sharing that happens in these uh, WhatsApp groups. What we noticed as we did this was uh, the circle of contact, uh, the circle of uh, what we would call is expanding and widening the circle of support within the community was naturally happening. It, prior to COVID, we would be doing the door knocking. We are identifying members and we are putting them into a database and inviting them for conversations. But with COVID and the restrictions and the WhatsApp groups, the people on the ground were introducing new members and new neighbors into these circles. And the circle is widening almost naturally on its own. And we took then a backseat, a deliberate effort uh, to pass on the power to our members, right? So that they can reclaim agency. I think this is one of the things that we, I felt was very, very important uh, in kind of fading away. So this is Social Worker Day, and I'm actually proposing a model where we fade into the background. We fade away. We don't disappear. We're not running away from the pandemic or the crisis. What we are doing is to be able to pave the way uh, such that community is front and center. 
of the work that we do. And uh, knowing that, you know, the, the word experts of their own lives has been mentioned and truly recognizing that they are experts and they are feeding back to us what they are experiencing. So when we talk about rebuilding, it is community voices, is rebuilding with the community feedback uh, that, that is being provided and encouraging members to lead initiatives that rally the community together so that they are taking ownership uh, of their circumstances. Um, so these are the few projects that I wanted to share about, but I won't have time to share about all of them. We are 18 months into the crisis. So now I think we are close to, we are 24 months into the crisis. 18 months into the crisis, uh, we started ha having initiatives that involve and engage participants actively so they can be supported to address the issues that directly impact them. Uh, a large part of it is to do with employment, but it's also to do with learning, financial su uh, support, as well as leadership and ownership within the communities. And uh, there are five key projects that are currently ongoing that Beyond is, uh, is working on. Uh, I will be touching on two of them. Uh, the rest of it, you have to approach me after the panel to, to hear more about. But what has come out of this is amazing, amazing participation, as well as new learnings for us as community workers on how do we continue these initiatives uh, as we move forward. So, So Can We is a self-employment for women. And these are some of the women in the So Can We project. They were already good seamstresses before the pandemic started. So some of them were, some of them had to learn on how to sew, but together they kind of learned uh, and they also got support from volunteers on how to expand their uh, products. So I will just share with you before uh, in the recovery phase in 2020, right? So as COVID hit, we had a lot of uh, corporate sponsors and partners who said, you know, uh, we would like to fund you to make some masks because we know, we know that you have women who can sew. So the COVID uh, gave the community mothers an opportunity to explore new revenue earning opportunities. So they, they were initially mainly focusing on baking and selling their, their goods, but they realized that during the pandemic, they were unable to sell their baked goods. And uh, then they relearned some of them. Some of them were already uh, knew how to sew. So the face masks orders came in fast and furious. And they quickly learned about what type of fabrics to use, whether the, what type of filters. So it is not only about sewing a pretty mask, it's also make, ensuring that there is safety. So learning about what is the safety behind wearing a mask, how do we choose fabrics that are suitable for it and so on uh, was a good discussion that they had. They gained new confidence, new skills. They took ownership of the orders and they supplemented their income by running these projects more or less independently with support from my colleagues who would go out shopping with them to look at fabrics and design and so on. As this happened, what Beyond was doing was to widen the circle of support around these mothers. So the orders were coming in through corporate partners and others and, and other groups and other uh, associations and uh, membership associations. And what we would do is link them to the women. And uh, we also brought in volunteers to support the women to build up this as a, as a business of sorts so that they are, they are cooperating at the same time, they're also there to share the revenue and so on. So the collective hard work in 2020 resulted in um, them earning together collectively 25K uh, over 10 months which is a lot of money uh, as compared to the previous projects that they were doing. And in rebuilding in 2021, the masks are still being sewn, but they also started launching new, pro uh, new products. So the new products uh, are you know, all sorts of things, right? Bags and pouches and so on. And you know, recently they were sewing beautiful uh, blouses for, for women. And uh, we, had, we had a group of volunteers who were doing this marketing on Instagram so that we could order it. Um, so please go and look at Instagram if you want to order some blouses for yourself. And uh, what was emerging in 2020 and 21 uh, is the collective ownership, the decision making on the projects that come to them. So previously, if we were introducing projects to them and they say, okay, we do it. Now we would say, this is coming in. What do you think? How would you like to uh, participate? How would you like to take this? So the decision making then becomes yes. And they take the ownership of the full cycle from uh, purchasing to design to delegating tasks among themselves, the costing, the charging, the delivery. And they are, I would say 80% working independently with some support from community workers. A few of them have also started their own home-based businesses where so they register their own uh, entity and they start uh, you know, producing other stuff that uh, they are not doing collectively with the group, but they want their own source of income. And one of the things that we found is of the six women who are most actively involved in this project, none of them have applied for social support for more than a year. 
So they have become self-sustaining. They are earning their own money and uh, they have formed a, such a strong bond with each other that they know that beyond this crisis, they are there for each other and they are there to support each other. So this is one key point that I wanted to say. When we provide a ground for these narratives and voices, what is happening is their social networks are being strengthened and they are seeking support from each other. The next one that I wanted to say is, uh, talk about is family circles. So we are circle people. I got this really nice diagram from another charity, but you know, we, we love circles. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful diagram, you know, shape that, that we often have, right? In, in the way that we work. And family circles is uh, loosely put together from Mauricio Miller's model of empowering decisions. So we, I'm using his name here, but I think he would not be, <laughs> he wouldn't endorse this particular type of work that we do because he's really about being completely hands-off. Uh, for us, we still hold a little bit. Uh, we, we hold hands a little bit, right? So uh, the premise is that people have resources, ideas, dreams, experiences from before, and uh, there's already an inherent potential. So then what we do them is uh, what we do is uh, give them the platform to share and to encourage one another and we empower their efforts. So, you know, this shifting into the fringes, disappearing from the scene, uh, slowly fading away is very much a part of the job. So we started engaging uh, families in uh, 2021. And these are families that have received uh, financial assistance uh, through beyond uh, COVID-19 family assistance fund, what I mentioned earlier. And uh, there were 391 families that received this financial assistance from us in 2021. Uh, we started calling all of them. So this is where interns are wonderful. They get ground experience in speaking to our members. And at the same time, they're also able to share and understand what this financial support means for the families. So interns, as well as my colleagues and other volunteers started calling these families to propose this idea that we want to start family circles. We want you all to come together to discuss what are solutions that you would like to adopt going forward. A hundred express interests in the circles, 50 signed up, 40 stayed in the group. Now there is fewer than 40, but the circles continue. So we have five groups that have been meeting regularly for the last seven months. There are three English speaking groups, one Malay speaking group and one Chinese speaking group. Uh, the Malay speaking group is entirely made up of uh, uh, foreign mothers. Uh, who are here Indonesians and uh, they are they are here and they and they are amazing right I think their focus on social networks is very strong they really go out to help each other they you know it's really a little village that they form amongst themselves and it's similarly for the other groups as well so the key goals of the family circles is to improve financial situation and it's also to allow uh, members to grow their social network and as they're doing that, right, data is gathered on what they hope to achieve, gain ideas, uh, you know, how, how are they sharing ideas, how they inspire each other and motivate each other. I uh, must say that before they came together, they do not know about one another's ideas. Some of them were already friends, some did not know each other. And uh, there are those who are more on, you know, silent and they're not so well connected. And now they can go for causes together. They can really talk about how they want to improve their lives. Hi, so Ronda. home business, yes. Yeah. Uh, we just request for you to wrap up soon so we can... Sure. Uh, the okay, that's good. Okay, I will. So some successes and some barriers, you know, I'll share the slides later. So there is some stuckness because I think the Zoom fatigue as well. So what I wanted to say is when we're talking about giving grounds to voices that matter, we are in the same storm but different boats. So let's listen what the different boats are saying. We want to gather wisdom uh, and insight from the members who are there. And from individual to collective, sharing this knowledge with all of you, then what can we do about it? And this current information on lived experiences, I hope, also impacts system and structural uh, efforts. So there were some changes to the to IMDA's uh, policies in terms of providing laptops, for instance. It may not, may not be a direct correlation, but I think me and my colleagues and others in other agencies were feeding back to IMDA, for instance, on home-based learning and its challenges. So basically, the outcomes of these are still to be measured. But what we are seeing right now is participation itself is an outcome that more people are speaking up and there is less uh, power differential within the, uh, among the members and us. And ultimately, I think it benefits the sector and that is what we are, we are looking at. And uh, when we talk about community informed practices, you know, evidence-based practice, I want us to, I want to leave you all with this thought, whose evidence? Is there enough space for the evidence that community provides uh, to shape our, our policies, our, our responses to what's on the ground? And ultimately, I think it is, Maybe we listen more, then we can learn something new. So thank you for listening. And I wish everyone a happy Social Workers Day.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ranga. Thank you, Ranga, for sharing your insights on why it's important to give ground to voices. All right, so I think uh, we can uh, go ahead uh, with our Q&A. Uh, am I going to see all the panels? Uh, the panelists? Oh, all right. Okay, now I can see all of you. Okay, so we do have a lot of uh, questions uh, coming in. Yes, so please uh, continue to post us your questions using the Zoom Q&A. Um, okay, perhaps I will uh, um, start with, with Timothy. Yeah, so I, I think I've tried to consolidate the questions together so that uh, Timothy can address them um, at the same time. All right, so I think there's a lot of curiosity and interest in, in why the thinking you know, behind safe uncertainty. And, and one of uh, our participants is, is wondering, why not safe certainty? Uh, since having certainty uh, gives us the assurance and security, isn't that something we ought to strive for? Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts about this? Is, it, uh, is, is, uh, is the move towards safe uncertainty because in this, in this world that we are living in, characterized by vol volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, and complexity, um, it's no longer you know, um, to strive towards safe certainty. <laughs> Uh, um, Timothy can attempt that, but before that, uh, perhaps um, another question as directed to you is that um, how can um, policymakers uh, make use of this of Mason's framework of safe uncertainty in terms of um, providing um, resources for the lower income? Yes. Perhaps uh, two to start you with and then more will come. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, from uh, two participants. I'm going to uh, in questions by highlighting uh, another concept that is to do with wicked problem. This is basically uh, an idea uh, raised by Rittle and Webel in 1973. The concept of wicked problems basically is about poverty, natural disasters, pandemic, and they have different sorts of characteristics. No definite formulation of what is a wicked problem. No quick fix answers. Solutions are not true or false. So as much as we talk about being in this environment of volatility, uh, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, um, I think it is important that when we are looking at the pandemic of like COVID-19, we cannot be so certain. When we are dealing with poverty, which is a very complex issue, it is a wicked problem that we cannot be so certain that one solution will fix all and um, one size fits all. I particularly appreciate uh, Rangus, the last presenter's uh, presentation, taking a hands-off position and uh, asking whose evidence is it. So whether it is for practice or whether it is evidence uh, or practice-based or evidence-based policy, I think we need to be very, very careful. And when what we need to be careful about is really our certainty about the solutions we can provide for what we call wicked problems, like the pandemic, like um, poverty, like natural disasters. So if we do not have the openness and we think that we have the answers, I think it can then become really dangerous with a certain kind of certainty. Um, look around the world, the Ukraine war, for example, these are situations when we have a certain certainty, it would actually create more harm than help. So um, this is my very quick uh, answer to you. So do read up on what is a wicked problem and therefore we would have a different orientation. And I think probably the person asking this question may be a younger person, which uh, need to have that certainty as you are developing. But as you grow and develop as a professional, as a person, you would appreciate how the uncertainty sometimes provide a lot more possibilities, a lot more resources that we can find in ourselves and our clients. That's just my take. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Timothy. Um, well, uh, I'll move on to, to uh, ask the questions um, surrounding 643, a lot of questions surrounding the 643 uh, Community Hub initiatives. Uh, so, um, okay. All right. So th there are some questions uh, um, 
uh, so there's a lot of interest and curiosities wondering uh, and uh, this uh, wondering why are you targeting only members from uh, low-income families? Yeah, what is the reason for this approach as opposed to building uh, the community through involving uh, a larger range of residents in the Amokyo neighborhood? Yeah, why the focus on low-income families? Uh, and, and also another related question is about what which residents do you actively recruit and target? Yeah, uh, what do you consider to well, when you want to target them for these initiatives? Yeah. Um, another one is related to, uh, okay, what is the role of um, the Residence Committee uh, or, you know, as RC or the grassroots in the role of this? You know, you have this 643 Community Initiative Hubs and then you have the RC's initiatives. So how do you work together or how do you reconcile that? Um, and lastly, uh, another um, question that we have is what are the challenges that you face at the beginning stages of community building work? Yeah. So yes, um, Adriana and Yen Zan would like to hear from you. Okay, let me answer one by one. Then. So the first question is on um, why focus, right? Okay, so maybe let me just correct myself. So I think the community model that we are advocating for is um, a model where citizens and residents, including beneficiaries, can co-create. So we're not saying that we're just focusing solely on low-income families. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, somehow during the pandemic, because we already had relationships with, you know, the families that we work with, so we just thought that, and then we can't, you know, just go out and outreach and co-call because, you know, that wasn't allowed during the pandemic, right? So we started with what's strong. We, felt, we started with people that we've had relationship with, we had rapport with, and we started that contribution and co-creation from the people that we've really, uh, had relationships with. And now we are actually expanding the circle to a lot more residents who are also non-beneficiaries. Um, you know, non yeah, so um, it, we are in inclusive, we're trying to build an inclusive community as well. Um, uh, the question on resident committees, right? Resident committees and 643 Community Hub. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think there's, you know, any difference, but, you know, 643 Hub, we also, um, we want to have greater inclusion and also focus on, you know, having the voices who would not normally be heard to come in and, and I think it's all about inclusion. Uh, I think these are different groups in the community, in ABCD work, right? We have a lot of, you know, informal groups, associations. Associations are part of the community. Um, but, you know, at 643 Community Hub, we also include, we want to include voices who would not normally be heard, um, you know, in, in policies or in decision making. So we also want to make sure of that. Yeah. Um, which other question? Other yeah. Perhaps yeah, I can, uh, if, if I may interrupt you and also invite uh, Ranga to share uh, her thoughts about this, because essentially you're also doing community work, but perhaps in a different neighbourhoods. So what are your thoughts about um, whether or not, uh, who, who do you target uh, for, for, for the involvement? Um, and, and, uh, and this is, are you targeting low-income families or would, would you be talking about community building with a larger range of residents? And uh, what, is the, uh, what is the role of the RC? And how do you work the RC in, in building communities? Yeah, I would say that the way we would do it is to initially do door knocking. That means we invite everyone as far as we can reach them. Then it is really based on their participation. So it's self-select. And often naturally, I think one of the questions is that do pe some people become more active? Yes, some people become more active. And then we would, we would see them as the main uh, uh, infectors using the COVID uh, <laughs> as an example. They would be the main mobilizers of other community members within uh, uh, the, the neighborhood. So naturally, the leadership will occur and uh, there will be some who will join for a while and then given their, their circumstances, they will drop out for a while, but that is a natural ebb and flow of, of community. So I would think that we have formed a good connection with some members who have stayed on over a period of time and they become the key community enablers within their own community. Uh, the role of uh, RCs in an ABCD format is they are partners. So we are not in competition. We are working in collaboration with RCs. In fact, most of the spaces that we use is borrowed spaces in the neighborhoods. So the RC would lend their space for learning programs, for distribution of food items, you know, and they become uh, uh, partners. And uh, I think the RC is a very formalized network. What we are trying to do with the residents is an informal network, which is more the social capital that the, the residents are uh, uh, building amongst themselves. Um, for beyond, we focus on the low-income communities, uh, the rental blocks, 64 rental blocks that we reach. I think Angmokyo's model is slightly different, similar to SEC, FSE as well. They actually engage people living in, uh, in purchase flats. Uh, beyond would be we're engaging largely people living in the rental flats, but the residents in the purchase flats can volunteer can come in with resources, which often happens. 
So we have a lot of friends in the community who will come in and say, I want to provide this, I want to do this or that. And such volunteers also come from other uh, neighborhoods. So outside of that uh, uh, rental housing neighborhoods, they come in to lend their support. I hope I have addressed uh, all the questions, Robin. Yeah. Yeah, as yeah. a follow-up, uh, I just want to invite um, Arts to, to also reflect on this. So from your research... Uh, Actually, has... I, I have a question. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, um, it's very interesting to hear both the models presented by Adriana, Yentan and also Ranga. I'm also wondering, where do older persons configure in your models? Yeah. They are very present, actually. Uh, because uh, I, I think they they really want to participate, right? So we found that in one of the neighborhoods that we are in, uh, a key uh, factor was isolation, right? Like what you pointed out. So how do we outreach to the to the elderly? So instead of providing a service because the other service providers, what we got was for families to engage the older people. And uh, then we work with the partners who are rolling out certain uh, programs. So there was a SIM card that was offered so that uh, uh, older people can have access, right? So then we work with the families and the young people to outreach to older people who may not know about it, may not know how to use these devices. And then the community then strengthens. So, you know, that's the difference, right? That when service providers come in, then it's an older person connecting with an uh, agency. Whereas when we bring in the community development components, then it is a community connecting with community. So, you know, it's, it's a, a, a neighbor who's close by can support the older person more so than a worker who only comes into work for a certain number of hours. So I would say that they are very much a part of our model. And when we provided the wireless uh, internet access, in the in the block one of the blocks in Angmokyo, uh, they were also using the wireless uh, internet access, uh, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, sorry, sorry, Adriana. Please go ahead. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so just want to chime in, just share a story. So 640 Community Up, there was one day where, you know, one elderly lady came in, the senior, one senior came in and she was asking me what this is about. You know, we had a conversation with her and then she said that, you know, she's living alone and, you know, she doesn't have a lot of friends around here. And we talk about the community hub and, you know, we asked what she's good at. So she's good at cooking Chinese food, you know, cooking healthy Chinese food. And I say, you know, there's a kitchen net here. You know, why don't you come down and, you know, share with us some of your, you know, uh, like cooking, you know, so we all can appreciate your cooking. So I think every week now she comes down and also I think, you know, able to also interact with you know people younger generation like children uh, and also adults and you know just make friends with people in the community so that 640 community hub is also inclusive in the sense that you know anyone is welcome into the hub you know, to build connections and just care for each other yeah. yeah because i'm really seeing the potential for a lot more intergenerational community building uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of our elders that we spoke to mentioned that they don't just want to receive support uh, they are very used to, in the past, being helping other people. But now they are the ones being helped. And that doesn't gel well with their self-esteem. So beyond just them being recipients or beneficiaries or having neighbours helping them, um, I think this model could also kind of emphasise, you know, what they are still able to contribute uh, to the community while they still can. But my, my other concern is also these are older persons who are healthy. They can step out. They can be there, be present in the community. But what about those who are, who are more frail? Um, and, and certain models in that, in that case to engage them needs to be kind of catered to them. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I suppose I want to pose this question to all of you, including Tim Timothy and Art. Uh, okay, so, well, I think in, in, in Ranga's presentation and Adriana and Yen-san's presentation, we have seen how um, this agency, social service agencies, have reorganized their work to reach out to the hardest hit during the pandemic. Um, so in your line of work, do have you observed how the SACs, the Senior Activity Centers, uh, or the RCs, or the grassroots, or even the FSCs, how have they, um, uh, uh, how have how have their approach in their work uh, taken a different turn in times of the pandemic? Do you have experiences to share with us on your observations on the ground? I mean, what I know from um, mm. talking to certain SAC staff mm. is innovation. Uh, now that the older persons can't come down to the center for activities, activities um, go to the person's home. So there's ramping up of, you know, getting people to understand how to WhatsApp so that there's video conferencing with family members. There's also regular calls. I mean, previously it was 
when there's something going on, then someone would call them. But now it's calling them almost daily or weekly to check in on them. So that was much appreciated. And some older persons were telling us why weren't these available before the pandemic? Because it'd be nice to have people call me, you know, and ask me how I am. Um, so basically, it makes the older person also realize that some things are actually very possible. Um, rather than sticking to the old ways of, you know, hey, come down to the center for you to get access to activities. But now we can engagement coming to your to yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we have to move on uh, quite quickly to um, to the topic of outcomes and funding. <laughs> so there are quite a few questions on outcomes and funding. So uh, Yen San spoke about focusing on the process as compared to the outcomes. So there are a lot of curiosities on how you manage to convince your management <laughs> of funders to focus on processes and not just the outcomes. And then there are also questions to do with, on a related note, how did AMK, FSC, community services secure funding for this process-driven model? Okay, I can come in for this. I, I think we are very privileged to have a management who is very supportive of community building. They are very supportive and they put in a lot of resources. So, I mean, for, you know, fundraising, we do our internal, I mean, our own fundraising, we raise funds for just for community building. Um, and yeah, but, but that being said, um, you know, how to, you know, show, right, or convince that this is the right. But I think, um, so I think, I think, I think telling stories, about you know stories of contribution, stories of how the community came together, uh, is can be a convincing way of, of telling them about you know how this could potentially work. Um, and and another way to also win the management or like win the staff or colleagues over into this approach is to I think invite them, open the invitation for them to also into this process of co-creation so they can experience for themselves how it feels like to you know to have this co-creation process in the community. I think those are some strategies that we've employed uh, when it comes to convincing or I think trying to I think show them you know how it could work in, on the ground yeah if I can also chime in yeah I think in our conversation with our management um I guess uh, some of our management uh they are still holding on to cases so they do see they do have they do serve beneficiaries still and I think um, one of uh, one of our management the beneficiary is um, also very active in community work and that's how um, she was able to see the impact of community work in for this particular case. And that was what um, also helped her see the value in the work and also become uh, more supportive in the efforts, yeah, in, in the team in doing, in doing this also. Yeah, so I, I think that would also help. And of course, sharing the narratives. Uh, I think one of the things that we also do is also we, we cross learn from other agencies as well to also see how things are working. So I guess uh, that could be a way to also, in a way, like case study, la, to also like see what may work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I remember one of you mentioned about participation in itself is an outcome. <laughs> so for Ranga, how successful are you getting your funders, board members, uh, management um, in, in uh, trying to understand that, to focus on process and not just outcomes? With great difficulty. <laughs> So we we do have to provide numbers. We do have to provide uh, you know outcomes, and uh, I think the outcomes we we do focus on the participant research, right? So it is really feedback that we are trying to collate and see what is helpful, sure and, not- and then to be vulnerable, uh, to be able to say that yeah, sometimes we did make it. Uh, and I think that is important because if we are working towards us succeeding, maybe community will not succeed. So right. that is uh, the reminder. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have to wrap up this session soon, but I'll just leave uh, the I mean the panelists with one last question, and everyone can contribute to this. Is that, uh, well, so there's this question that I think is quite pertinent. How do social service professionals grapple with the tension between encouraging community work and addressing structural gaps in our system? So structural gaps can be about the in- inadequate income, like of job security poor working conditions and inadequate living spaces, for example. So how do you all grapple with the tension of, um, you know, encouraging communities to be resilient, to build communities, to help themselves versus addressing uh, structural gaps in our systems? Yeah. Timothy, well, would you like to go first? <laughs> Sorry. I guess for me as a social worker, it is important that we engage our communities in generating, I think, evidence um, so it could be um, a personal issue that would link to a social cause. So it could be the good work that I'm hearing 
this morning from Beyond and from Amokyo. And I think it would be a shame if we do not document some of the processes as well as some of the outcomes that have come out from the work that you do, reflect on it, present it in a paper, and even a policy brief to people who need to know, including the RCs, including even members of parliament, including, say, the government. And it could be one case, two cases, and when rigorous, rigorously done through social work practice research, for example, success case stories or impact stories, I think the difference can be made. Thanks. Thank you. Art, would you like I, to go next? Or? Can I, I would just yes, unmute yes, it myself. Yeah. So I'm yeah. thinking that grappling with is, uh, is essential to the work. I, we play different roles. And uh, it is what uh, Timothy has actually said, you know, so we gather evidence on the ground, which was part of my slides. It is, we gather evidence on the ground, we, we create that as public knowledge, we share that information, and then we co-create. So it is the roles that we play. Uh, it is not to say that government is not, uh, structurally, it is not, it's not being done. It is being done. But where we are coming in is to actually gather the evidence on the ground. So I, I think it is, that is a constant uh, challenge. And uh, uh, in fact, we should welcome that challenge, right? Because then we are co-creating solutions. Yeah, I was just thinking about this question because while you, uh, well, the other panelists were presenting, I wrote a note saying, how do we empower those who are disempowered or those who exist in disempowering structures? I mean, you can come in, come together, feel that you have the power to co-create solutions, but at the end of the day, you are asked very demeaning questions about your income, whether you have children to support you again and again and again, that strips people of their self-worth. So I, I want to also think about how the participants feel. And one point, they feel empowered because they are given power to the community. Um, and, and, you know, sharing power, but at the same time, they have there are these processes that strips away your dignity. So that was a question I had while listening to the presentation. Um, for myself, I don't see this, um, these two co-creation and addressing structural gaps as necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, the word co-creation itself is about, you know, you know, having a voice, so basically having a chair on the table on, on, on you know, crafting policies. So I don't know whether they'll come to a world or, you know, a time where, you know, um, in a policy making session, you know, it's not only like policy makers, but also people with lived experience who are there together to, to craft policies because they have intimate knowledge, you know, they, they have inter intimate knowledge of their own life, of their own community that could, I think, give a lot of insights to how policies are made to the best, to, for the benefit of the community. So, yeah, just something, just an idea, like, you know, you can bring them to policy dialogue or, you know, workshops, you know, to create policy or inform policies. Yeah, so just an idea, a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. I think just expanding from what Adriana shares, I think, um, I think as social workers, we do work with the most vulnerable people um, in the society. Um, and I guess, in a way, it's also um, our role to, to advocate. Yeah, I think I also concur with what um, Timothy and also Rangers um, sharing that um, we should also find platforms to, to voice out, to be the voice for, for the beneficiaries that we work with. Yeah, I guess um, something like what we are doing right now is also a way of advocacy. Yeah, but it's also really looking at um, more platforms yeah, to share on behalf of them. And even better, you can invite them to be in the panel someday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah um, yes, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I echo um, Ranga's uh, suggestion and a recommendation uh, to have uh, perhaps a future seminar or conference theme uh, regarding are we, we are helping, but are we really helpful? So <laughs> I think it'll be really refreshing to invite um, the community members to come uh, and really share how, how the work has impact, impacted them. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm reminded by my colleagues that I need to close the session. I apologize that we're not able to address each and every question out there. There are a lot and there's a lot of excitement in the topics that are presented. So um, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to take this chance to thank our panelists today, uh, Renga, Yenzan, Adriana, Art, and also Timothy. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, yes, I think I have to pass the time back to Cleona.